So welcome again to College Success, Assistive Technology Tools and Strategies for College. We're going to move right into the objectives for today. We're going to be increasing your knowledge of assistive technology and help you understand how AT, assistive technology, can help a student transitioning to college or in college. We'll help you understand your knowledge of the array of tools, services, and resources, and understand how to find a process for AT consideration. So the bulk of our discussion today will be on point number two. So let's move in with just a brief, brief uh, introduction to the concept of IEP transition planning. So transition planning, that is a process. And if, if the child is on an IEP with the public school system, then transition planning must begin by the age of 14 and be the plan should be ready for implementation by age 16. And so in that process, there is the development of a summary of performance and those students will, um, have surveys and some evaluations done to develop some knowledge about their baseline academic level, their cognitive level, functional levels of that student. And then in, the, in that summary of performance document, they'll summarize any other accommodations and modifications and assistive technology that's been essential in the high school um, education assisting that student in achieving, you know, the progress that they've been making. And so I will share with you a sample of the summary of performance in your resource guide. All right. And so the purpose of transition planning is so that um, students will be able to focus or the team will be able to focus on any other goals um, that the student has in mind for themselves for after high school. And so the team can add any other types of uh, elements into the IEP to help the child, help that student work in that direction. So part of this transition planning can include these five steps, the assessment, self-determination, um, discussing of options like their work option, educational options. So educational options may include four-year college, two-year college, um, you know, career education, uh, and then some other independence, uh, you know, opportunities for them. Do they want to live independently? Those types of things can be discussed in transition planning, as well as, you know, who's going to do some research about colleges and programs or how will the student be supported in that endeavor? And then develop goals and explore assistive technology options to meet those types of goals. So that's transition planning just in a brief, brief nutshell. If you would like to learn more about transition planning, take a look at our PHP e-learning. We have a lot on these topics on our website so you can um, get information through our Connections California website and then find um, information there about the transition process, okay? All right, so let's move into the AT tools and how they can be supporting transition. So let's talk about what is assistive technology. So assistive technology is defined as both the device and the service. And the device is basically anything that helps a person do something they couldn't do because of their disability. It helps co compensate for um, any learning disability and it can capitalize on the strengths of the, of the student. It doesn't include things that are medically implanted in the person. And the device can include any sort of technology that is low tech, um, even no tech like the strategies and mid tech up through high tech items. So that is the device 
And so what do we mean by service? The service is the supports, um, including things like assessments, tutorials of using the AT, AT training, implementation, um, discussing timelines and future meeting dates. Uh, and so all these things that are designed to support the user. And so in the nitty gritty of what a service can involve is, you know, all these elements from evaluation, acquisition, selecting, designing, fitting, customizing, adapting AT, um, maintaining, repairing, replacing the AT, as well as coordinating services and support. There might be several people that work with the student. And so besides training the student, also other professionals and employers, and of course the parents should be included in the discussion of training needs. And earlier we mentioned that AT could be low tech, mid tech and high tech. This is what is referred to as a continuum of AT options. And so the no tech options would include a reference to strategies and support. So AT is available in all of these forms. So some areas of support when we're talking about a student, especially looking at higher levels of learning, these are some examples of areas of support that we might initially consider. And then Upon deeper discussion, we might realize that, you know, besides just the initial academic areas, there are other areas that affect learning as well, such as organization, planning, social skills, anxiety and mental health areas, disability disclosure, having the student be able to um, reveal and describe their disability and how it affects their learning um, and their ability to advocate for themselves. So these are all areas that AT can be supporting a student. And so what are the benefits? Sometimes people will think that, you know what, isn't that giving that particular student an unfair advantage? Well, there's research that shows that that's not true. What it is doing is it's leveling the playing field because these individuals with learning disabilities have an invisible disability. And so for them to have access to their education, we need to level that playing field by allowing them to have compensatory tools and strategies so that their disability is not a barrier to their learning. And other conditions uh, or considerations include, what is the emotional impact of using the AT? You know, is the student in the right mindset for using it? Do they have that emotional buy-in? Is there any stigma that needs to be managed or considered um, that might be a barrier to the successful implementation of AT? Has there been enough training for everyone involved with the student and their learning? And is now the right time for this type of AT? Maybe if there's some other uh, urgent crisis going on, maybe that's not the right time to add another layer of complexity to, to their lives by introducing the ATs. So these are all things that um, should be considered by the team when considering AT. And then also know that the introduction of assistive technology is not going to make the disability go away. The disability is still there. And so that's why the strategies and coaching the individual how to use the AT is really important because the disability is still there. They're just trying to figure out how can they use something um, to help them compensate for their disability. And there's a really interesting article, uh, some research that came out uh, a year or so ago uh, by um, this graduate student about AT and identity. So that just put that reference there for you in case you're curious. Right, so let's move into the tools. And so 
I'm introducing this concept of no tech or low tech AT. And so when we're talking about the older, uh, more mature student, um, could be middle school, could be high school, could be college level, um, there is less low, I mean, less low tech options available to them. There are several options, but they mostly focus around uh, sensory needs um, and and visual processing, things like that when you're when you're um, using manipulatives. And so uh, these are some just general examples of what low tech tools might look like. And we'll go back into that and um, low tech options for reading and writing and such later. So when we're talking about high tech options for AT, we'll see many options because that's just the direction of our society or culture and um, the unique nature of um, you know, coding. Coding can create all kinds of unique things that we never knew we needed and to address unique areas of, of um, disabilities that we never had supports in before. So there are more and more options being developed um, and these would be the high tech options. So we'll find them in the forms of extensions. Uh, extensions are kind of little software nuggets that you can add on to your existing um, browser or uh, you know, whichever browser you're using. You can also download different apps. You can download software, but this software option is becoming less and less common because more and more the companies are moving towards subscription models that are used through the browser. And so of all these high-tech options, we can, you know, you'll find them at the Play Store, Chrome Store, App Store, wherever you download software. And you'll find in the array that exists, you'll find some that are more basic, more simple, less features, maybe easier to use. And then you'll find others which have many more features. They might be more complex. They might need more training, require more support for the user to ramp up their successful usage of them. So just kind of the getting a lay of the land of what's out there. So we'll start with the reading area. So remember we talked about there are many academic areas um, that could be addressed by, by AT. So we'll start with reading. And so reading is so fundamental to everything that we do. Um, so know that when a student is moving to higher and higher levels of learning, that there's a change from, and you know, this is a, just a general image, you're not meant to be able to read any of that text, but just at a glance, you can tell that on the left image, which is an image of a high school textbook, you know, you see vivid graphics, you see bolded words, you see, you know, clarifying text on the left, you see highlights throughout other bolded areas, it makes it more digestible for a student to easily process, to read and glean the important information. As opposed to taking a look at this research article, everything is just written very um, dryly. There aren't, there are few visuals. Maybe you might find a, a, a graph or chart somewhere or a data table that lists the data that was collected in the research. But but the language that they use also is is more sophisticated, written at a higher level for a highly educated person. And so we need to anticipate that this reading level is going to take a jump up and already understand that we need some strategies for approaching the reading. Right. So that would be part of the AT as well, having strategies to support usage of the technology. And I do have in a resource list a lot of different strategies listed for, for that, including how to read um, college level text and research articles and the like. Okay. 
All right. So this is transitioning us to the different categories of AT that we're going to be reviewing today. So reading, writing, organization and planning, note-taking, math, sensory, anxiety and mental health, as well as some disclosure, disability disclosure tools. So all of these areas we're going to be moving through right now. All right, so a few low tech items for reading. Um, and again, these require some strategies for using when you're talking about highlighting, whether it's with the regular highlighters or using highlighting tape that you can tape like a post-it note right into a book that you're reading. And this book could be for leisure, it could be a textbook, it could be for a hobby, whatever it is, highlighting tape can be stuck right in it. It comes off of a tape dispenser, just like regular tape does, but it's um, removable, just like post-it notes are. And you can use a strategy for tagging different types of information in the book. Um, and so highlighting can be an assistive technology option. Um, and so some people might ask, well, when does something like a highlighter change from being just, you know, it's it was invented at some point. So a highlighter is a piece of technology. When does it become assistive technology? Well, it becomes assistive when it's being used to help a person to manage their disability. So that's when the assistive piece comes in. So if somebody has a visual processing disorder or dyslexia where their eyes have um, difficulty you know, decoding already, and then the tracking piece on top of that is extra difficult, using the highlighting option to mark certain places in the book so that they can more easily track, they can more easily be decoding with less um, cognitive requirements. And so that's when a highlighter changes from being a piece of technology and becomes a piece of assistive technology. It's helping the person overcome their, or help them manage their disability. Okay, um, I see some questions in the Q&A and then we will get to those soon, but feel free to pop in more questions there, okay? All right. Um, so we have a variety of things. These are all, uh, for the by and large, used to help somebody with their visual tracking or processing. It could be used for helping the eyes to find where they need to focus so that they can decode the words on a page. It can help block out certain areas like this one. Um, this reading guide blocks off some of the space around it so your eyes can focus on the part in the middle. Okay, and then AT does not need to be purchased all the time. You can certainly decide to make it yourself. And some, these are some high-tech options. Um, so when we're talking about AT for reading, these can be commonly found in uh, different types of tools that are built into your computers. Um, so these are just the common ones. You might have something that can read aloud, something that can highlight. Uh, you can change fo fonts and change the spacing between words, maybe make the words taller, shorter, um, things like that, have more space between each line, maybe bring in margins so at that it's more narrow. You can add color filters. Sometimes there's masking and then picture or picture dictionary. This happens to be an example of a picture dictionary. So if you hover over a word, then a picture icon will pop up. It just supports the reader a different way. Other types of literacy tools may include like a PDF screenshot reader. 
Uh, it uses optical character recognition, OCR, optical character recognition, to pull the text out of an image or a diagram, and then it's able to read it. You can also levelize a text, which is like simplification. It takes out the complex words and substitutes in more easier, lower level terms so that maybe it just smooths out the reading process. Summarizing, maybe it shortens a long article into its main points. Note taking, uh, note templates. Also, there are bibliography makers annotation tools, page simplification, translation, and audio, uh, like a voice note maker, audio maker. Okay, so we'll see uh, lots of examples of these as we get into specific tools shortly. So speaking of the built-in and easy to access uh, tools that you could use, again, these are just settings in the computer in the computer and you could, anybody has access, they're universally available, but they become assistive when somebody needs to change the settings so that it helps them to compensate for their disability. And so colors can be more harsh or more easy on the eye. So testing out which color and which uh, levels of contrast might be appropriate for that reader. So you can see color on color has a lower level of uh, color contrast ratio compared to the light gray on dark gray, or even if you used white on black, obviously that would be the, the most contrast. And then different fonts. So research has shown that there are some fonts that are much easier to read by people with, with dys, uh, dyslexia um, and other visual processing disabilities. So things like Arial or uh, Calibri, even the, um, uh, that the what is this? The, it's like a cartoon font, right? These are very simple and basic. They don't have a lot of strange wiggly lines. They have a nice amount of spacing um, like as compared to this font where it's a little bit squished together and then it's all capitalized and the letters are very skinny. It just has some other challenges to that font. And the first one has a little bit of flair. It certainly is uh, beautiful and, and artistic, but it's more challenging for somebody who already has dyslexia or a visual processing challenges to, to read that easily. And earlier we mentioned uh, print size and word spacing, maybe line spacing as well. So as your eyes read this phrase, you can see, probably start to see where at what size does it feel like it's easier to, to read for you. All right. Okay, I'm going to add, address this, uh, this question that just came in regarding text leveling, where the text is simplified for effective reading, how effective are those systems for specialized scientific jargon? Would read aloud be a useful substitute at that point? Um, it really depends on the user, right? So when we're doing an, an a real um, assistive technology consideration discussion, we would talk about the cognitive level of the user. We would consider um, all the areas of need for that user. So if they have, if they're able to function a very high level, we certainly could be um, seeing if the read aloud alone could work for them. Right, that would be the, the easiest level way to try AT is the read aloud because it's universally available. And if that person, we could also time that person. If it takes them a long time to read that, um, we could try levelizing and do another time test. So we could bring the, the level of the text down um, and then give another time test as just an example. Okay, so those would be uh, how we could collect some data 
or how to decide where to start, right? But really looking at the strengths and the disability, the data that exists for that individual is what we would use as our starting ground for, is this type of AT appropriate, right? What is the functional area that we're trying to address and what type of tools might be appropriate, right? And then it's kind of a trial, trial and error type of process at that point. Right. So speaking of the read aloud, and we mentioned there's a lot built in. So if you're not sure where to find it, if you look in your accessibility settings, whether it's the operating system of your computer, your phone or your tablet, uh, sometimes internal to the apps. So Microsoft has their um, immersive reader. Apple has, Apple has their read aloud and Google Workspace has I think they also call it read aloud, um, but you can find them in either the toolbar or the accessibility settings. Uh, browsers sometimes will be able to have it built in as well. Um, and so I'm a big fan of Immersive Reader because it's so tool packed and it's free. So we're going to take a look at that later and see all its features. So as an example of what, um, while somebody is reading, having something read aloud and getting some visual support. So this happens to show dual highlighting. Single highlighting would be just, um, you know, one, imagine that the whole page is blue and then the yellow box is moving with the read aloud voice. Um, but if this were on a white page, and the section that is being read was blue and the blue section was shifting as each the yellow um, highlighting shifted from one line to the next, then that would be the dual highlighting. So we'll see single highlighting on this page. So this is an example of immersive reader. You see that it's kind of grayed out most of the most of the lines. So that's masking. So when uh, it helps kind of push away or fade away most, a section of the text, and then it's highlighting just the word that it's reading, but it's also making bold or leaving bold um, in black text, the, the line that the highlighting is on as it's reading aloud. So this is just an example of what the immersive reader um, might look like reading a, a section of a web page. So if we were to look at math, so immersive reader will also work in the um, in different apps that it has. So I think this is their their notes version. And so it's reading aloud, it's turning on immersive reader and then clicking where to start and it starts reading it aloud. And the voice qualities are very good. Even though they are digitized voices, they are, they are actually really good voice qualities. And there are so many for you to choose from that you should be able to find one that is, is um, a good fit or the better fit for the user. So Immersive Reader has some additional functionalities. And so what um, I've been really impressed with is these other free tools that it has built in. So it says nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. And you can see that you can click them on and it changes the colors of the words according, accordingly. So nouns will be purple, the verbs turn red, the adjectives will turn green, and adverbs will be the gold color. Okay. And then furthermore, it also has uh, a syllables function. So if the student needs to read something aloud and they want to try with some additional support, maybe the student is self-conscious. Some students who are self-conscious about reading aloud and have a disability, they can write into their um, their 504 or their IEP, that one of their accommodations is that they will get advance notice of what they're, they'll be asked to say, uh, read aloud in class. 
Um, so it's not sprung on them. They can prepare in advance and rehearse the reading and put into place all the scaffolding that helps them become um, supported so that their disability is not uh, interfering with their ability to perform their academic task. So syllabification is another tool to consider for that. All right, and um, AT for reading. So I listed some examples, and these are kind of the the you know the top the top six here are the the bigger players. A top five here, um, and so these are all browser based. You can download all of them by, uh, through browser extensions. Um, they're tried and true. They are all subscription based and they're very comprehensive. They have a lot of tools packed into that. Now, whether that's a, uh, appropriate for a user also depends on their academic and cognitive uh, levels as well as their disability, right? What, what areas of need might affect their ability to use this variety of tools. Right? For others, it might seem overwhelming. So too much is just too much for those people. But just um, a starting list of comprehensive tools. Um, I just listed them here. And then some that are a little more simple, more basic, not as complex. I listed them here on the right. So let's take a peek at one of these. Uh, we're going to take a look at three of the comprehensive tools. This one is read and write. And just by the title, you can tell it's both a combination of a reading and writing support, but we're going to talk about the reading aspects now, and we'll come back to it when we're in a writing section. So as a reading tool, you can see here in the toolbar, so you download this as an extension from the Edge Web Store, the Chrome Web Store, or whatever, um, uh, wherever you're downloading your apps from, or your extensions from, to install in your browser. And this toolbar pops up. You can click in the settings and simplify this toolbar. And so you can cut down on however many tools are visible. Perhaps we're working with younger students or somebody with a cognitive level that's lower. And so they need a more simple toolbar appearance for them to be successful. Or maybe they're extremely anxious, or maybe they have visual processing issues. And so if they don't benefit from having all these tools here visible, perhaps it's appropriate for those learners to click away and turn off some of these other tools that they, they won't need. And we can always turn them back on when they are needed. And so here we have um, kind of a, a lookup tool. We have the, pic, the dictionary function. Um, this is also a kind of a picture dictionary function. You can add a voice note here. Um, you can play whatever text. And this is showing you in a Google Doc that you can um, select the text and then it can read it aloud. You can pause, you can play. Um, you can also add some masking to it. So again, it's kind of like the dual highlighting and the masking will darken the areas that are far away from the area where the eye is trying to track. So that's a great feature for people with visual processing challenges. Uh, so it has a PDF reader, it has highlighting tools as well. And those can be useful for making the reading process really active. You can have a strategy for how to use highlighters here too. And when you click the collect button, the circle with the multicolors, then it will collect it into a Google Doc. And then the person will, it'll automatically open up a Google Doc and then all the highlights will appear in there, those groupings. Or you can, when you click this, it'll ask you which colors you want to collect, and you can select which colors you want to extract. And so those are some handy tools there. So if we look at another, compare this to another reading, comprehensive reading tool, this one is by Don Johnston. And um, 
you know, Texthelp and Don Johnson's are now merged into one company, but they're keeping their products uh, unique and separate. So they're maintaining all their products as far as I know at this point. So Snap and Read is their reading tool. And so they have separated their reading tool from their writing tool. It is subscri subscription based. And so um, it turns out the reading and writing tool from Don Johnston is about equivalent to the, the one fee for the reading and writing tool for from text help. So they're pretty, pretty similar, but some of their their specialty features are unique. So let's take a look. So here's um, kind of an illustration of what their toolbar is. And so it's showing you how when you have a web page open, this is being used in the browser and the toolbar will appear on the right side. And then you could click on the reading function and click on the text and it starts reading it aloud. The other icon you see there with the dotted box with the plus sign, uh, that is kind of a universal icon for select. And so in this case, it's select to speak and it will optical use optical character recognition to read aloud text that might be embedded in a picture or a graph. Um, uh, infographic, et cetera. Okay. The icon below that is the simplify. And so earlier we mentioned maybe uh, simplification might be useful. So this is, this is um, that icon. And so here we see the simplification tool being used. So it's highlighting those words and then it says simplify. So it's not simple, I mean, you can, select a large amount of text and it will simplify a larger amount, but it's just showing you just a couple of, of um, one portion of a sentence right here. Below the simplify icon is a translate icon. And so that one, um, you know, it can translate text as well. And down here at the bottom is a uh, it's their active reading information collection tool. And so at, if you're reading something on a website, then this tool can gather, uh, if you highlight something on that web page and then click it, click the icon, it'll kind of pop that sentence or phrase that you highlighted into a sidebar. Another sidebar will open on the side. And then you'll see the text extracted to that location. And it'll also have a reference a source information with that. So that's really handy for collecting information. If you're working on research, researching ideas, collecting ideas, um, it's great for that. On top of that, included in this is uh, a template tool. And so if you're researching information for a compare and contrast type of assignment, then you could download their comparison and compare and contrast template and then pop it into that type of outline format. So it provides some additional structure on that level. So there are lots of different templates. Um, you could always check it out. Um, two week free trial for both Snap and Read, I mean, for all the Don Johnston, as well as the um, text help products two week free trial, and then you can opt in on um, a paid subscription if, if, if you would like. But um, I should say that the read and write tool has its read aloud I, um, tools free. So even if you lapsed on the two week free trial, the, if you opened up that toolbar, the read aloud tools will still work for you, but the other tools in the toolbar will be faded out a little bit to indicate that they're not activated with your level of membership. All right, so um, Helper Bird, uh, it's, it's changed and evolved a lot over the last few years, and it's become an extremely um, established, comprehensive product. And so um, I'll just play a little, it has a quick little introduction here to the product. 
Oops. Is the sound coming out? I don't hear it. Well, I think in the essence of time, I will, um, I put the link there in the, uh, I'm going to pop it into the chat right now so that you guys can just save the chat later and you'll have this link there. Um, but it pretty much does, works very similarly to the, um, the two previous products, but I wanted to highlight this one because it's really come up a lot. It uses the immersive reader as one of its tools. Um, and so, you know, immersive reader is a Microsoft product and it's open source. So they've pulled that in, in a, um, into their product and uh, built their product around that. It has all the same um, adjustments that you can find uh, in the other two products as well. So you can check out Helper Bird also. Okay. All right. And so now that we've reviewed all these different tools we could be using for reading, what can we, we, be, we be reading besides the web? So you can download different types of digitized text from, and if you have a print disability, you can get a free membership with Bookshare and download books, or you can go with a paid uh, subscription to Learning Ally, which I think now is $135 for a year. Uh, the difference between the two, the main difference besides the, uh, the, the price free versus subscription fee of 135 is there is human narration in the Learning Ally program. Whereas in Bookshare, you would use a third party extension or reader like any of the, um, the three products that we showed earlier, those would all work fine with the, uh, the Bookshare books. And you would use that, uh, that reader with any, any type of book that you download. So um, with Learning Ally, you have to use their built-in toolbar. So check on their website to see whether uh, you would be eligible or somebody you know might be eligible for their product. But what if you're not eligible? What if you don't have a print disability like dyslexia or visual impairment, uh, visual processing issues? Then you'll, you can find some other options available like the open eBooks. Digital Public Library of America. There are public domain books. There are subscriptions. Libraries can provide them. Uh, there are also audio versions on YouTube with closed captioning. So there are other sources available if you don't have a print disability. Okay. And so if you're not familiar with this term public domain, Public domain just means that their intellectual, intellectual property laws are no longer applying to them. So at that point, you know, every year on January 1st, there's a whole nother set of books that get announced that are now part of public domain books. And so, you know, in the book world, it's a very auspicious day because there's more material to add to the public domain libraries. All right, so let's shift from reading, assistive technology from reading to assistive technology for writing. And we'll start with low tech options. And so you might, um, you know, the few things that, that I've illustrated here include the pencil grips, perhaps person doesn't have a standard grasp because of some um, uh, condition in their hand or their ability uh, to stabilize. And so they need an adaptive implement for writing. Uh, this, this plastic thing just holds paper. You put the paper in the slot and it holds the paper up. So positionally, it's more ergonomically um, situated for your eyes to move from that to perhaps a computer screen and back and forth. Um, so that might be something to use. Perhaps you need 
some dotted paper. And um, it could be, you know, paper that has raised lines uh, or, you know, maybe the dots are spaced farther apart or closer together, depending on the needs of the individual to have visual references to guide their um, the writing process. And slant boards are helpful for adjusting the position to get the ergonomics of the arm position placed appropriately for that person who needs support writing. Okay, so these are just some of the things that are available for writing. Again, there aren't a lot, but you know, this is this is a small handful of some things that might help are common to use. So for high tech, you might consider high tech options in any of these areas for handwriting, fine motor issues, spelling and grammar, vocabulary needs, written expression, organization, note taking and to support memory. Right. And one of the most common ones is voice typing. And, you know, this one comes up a lot and I think it's also not used a lot. <laughs> and I'm actually a big fan of it because I think nowadays, you know, we almost all have some sort of headset with a microphone. And so being able to access like a good microphone, or at least a, um, you know, the having an external microphone is m has much better sound pickup quality, and so it's recommended to use one with an external microphone, and then it can also require somebody to practice their articulation skills, and you might need to modify how you dictate your words so that you separate each word so that the voice typing algorithm can pick up your words more easily, period. Right? And you have to add the punctuation as well. Um, and it's a good idea to have some strategies supporting this. Like if you're using voice typing or dictation, um, it's also called speech to text, to say as much of your train of thought and get it all out on paper and then either have it read back to you with um, text to speech software and then do the editing after you do you know a chunk of the voice typing first so what i've shown you here in this visual is how to find it in the chrome browser um, it's under the tools tab. So it's right there for anybody to access. Um, but again, you can find these types of things built into pretty much every um, browser or your operating system these days. All right. And I think we're all pretty familiar with, you know, uh, spelling and grammar supports because I think even when we're texting and we don't need it, sometimes it's changing our words for us and sometimes changing it accurately and sometimes not. <laughs> but if you wanted to try something that wasn't built in, here's a few that you could look into. Grammarly is really tried and true. Ginger has been around a long time, um, but for my experience, I couldn't figure out once my free trial was done how to stop the the prompt from popping up to get me to subscribe again. So um, to me, that kind of took a little shine off of it. And Grammarly, um, I didn't have those type of pop up issues disrupting my my workflow. And also, I tried out the Grammarly Pro edition uh, and it will also suggest beyond just spelling and and basic grammar corrections. It will also offer you rephrasing ideas for uh, a full sentence or a couple sentences in a row. So uh, it's a nice tool for somebody who might need that type of uh, writing support. Uh, virtual Writing Tutor is another one. Um, it operates similarly to the others. Just wanted to give you another option. 
Also, there are built-in supports for spelling. As we mentioned earlier, you might have already seen the little squiggly red line that's underneath some of the things that you are typing, and then you can hover over it or click on those that are that are indicated and opt in or out of that uh, spelling or grammar suggestions that's built into a lot of these tools. And I think we're pretty familiar with those. Now, if you're looking for something more sophisticated, because sometimes the word suggestions in the built-in spelling, it'll make mistakes and it will change the whole sound of our sentence because it, it substituted the wrong word. And it doesn't have smart word prediction. So what smart word prediction is, is an a algorithm that's written into this spell correct or grammar correction that considers the context and subject of the writing when making suggest suggestions is much different than word completion that's built into many devices. And so you can find smart word prediction in these types of products. So let's take a look at some of these smart word prediction products. So we'll start with Don Johnston's product, CoWriter. And here, as you're typing, perhaps in, in the Google Docs, you might be talking about Abraham Lincoln. You can also assign a topic to CoWriter. So you can go into the settings and say, okay, I'm writing about presidents, um, I'm talking about uh, slavery, and I'm talking about Abraham Lincoln. Um, and so you can add all these topic specific dictionaries to it to help it to hone and select words for you that will pop up in this word box. So as you're typing letter by letter, this word box will evolve its selections to match what it thinks you might be needing to write for that word. You can also um, do dictation and access the microphone, turn on the microphone with that option here. And so um, flexible spelling is something that is really unique to these products, these um, smart word prediction products, because be, you might be able to spell one word five different times. And each time you spell it, you find a new way of spelling it. And so that's what we refer to as inventive spelling. Uh, and so if this tool has flexible spelling uh, built into it, then each one of those you know, inventive ways that the student decides to try to spell a word, you know, it will try, it will identify and give you the correct uh, word suggestion in the choice box. So that's another option for that. Now, another product that Don Johnson has that you can add on top of CoWriter or to supplement CoWriter is uh, called Word Bank Universal. And what that is, is let's say you're browsing on this live science page and then you turn on your uh, extension that sits up here on your browser, you turn it on, and then you get this pop-up window that, that will pull out all these different vocabulary words. And then the, most, the more those words occur, more frequent those words occur on that web page, the larger the word appears in your word choice box. And so here's another example of how this pop-up box, it's a different topic now. Uh, this person's writing about the Wizard of Oz. And so they presumably opened up this Word Bank Universal on a web page that talked about the Wizard of Oz and pulled all these word choices out. And when they clicked into their Google Docs, the choice box popped over with that. And now the person can be writing in their Google Doc with a word choice box right next to them. So this could be applicable for anybody who um, has slow processing, working memory, even dyslexia. Um, they could benefit from this type of tool. So that's not the only tool built into this. 
So it also has a summarizing. So earlier I mentioned that summarizing was a certain tool and uh, perhaps they just need the, the gist of it. Perhaps their, their processing speed is lower. Maybe the cognitive load of reading is extremely high on that and they fatigue quickly. And so they might benefit from having that, that website summarized for them and then they can read it here and then write their, their essay because they still have to digest the information do their analysis. And so they're still producing the work product here in the Google Doc, but um, they're reading less information to base their analysis up upon. And there's yet one more tool built into this Word Bank Universal. And it's a location. So perhaps we're talking about Robert Frost. And on that web page, he has um, the, that web page reference all these different places where he lived, where he worked, uh, where he passed away. And so it might have those locations. And you can um, actually click on this icon and find out, see a map, see a very visually where all the are all those locations that were referenced in that, uh, in that web page. Okay, so just another tool, you can see the different icons listed at the top. Um, and so it was the word bank here on the first one, the summarizing, um, it also has a famous people. So similar to the map, it can list all the famous people that are referenced there in the article, um, and then the map. Okay. Right, and then back to read and write, it has the writing tools and we already mentioned the, the highlighting tools that can support writing. It also has the ability to have the smart word prediction. So it has that as you're typing in your document, it can suggest words. It also has a picture dictionary and that might be able to support the user as well. Okay. All right, I'm going to move to the next product and just talk about this really quickly. So if somebody is moving into a very technical level of their education, maybe it's any one of these types of, of areas of study, medicine, um, law, engineering, botany, vet medicine, dental, um, all of these areas can be um, supported using Spellex. Spellex has has the best vocabulary support of all of the um, writing tools that I mentioned earlier. So it has all of these vocabulary dictionaries kind of built into the product. It's already kind of sourced in there. And so that's um, built in. So really good for, you know, because if you have a disability, it doesn't mean you're not able to learn. They're extremely capable, smart people that have disabilities and when they find the right tool to help them overcome their disability, you know, there are no, no limitations to their future. So it's really exciting to have these types of options out there for them. Okay. Earlier, we mentioned the Microsoft um, uh, Immersive Reader tool, and it's built into all of these products that it has. Uh, and the one that we didn't mention earlier was this office lens. You can take pictures of it, of things, and then it could read things aloud for you, the optical character recognition piece. So maybe it's a menu, maybe it's a signage. Um, so things are really moving fast in this direction. You'll, you'll see that there are these types of you know, the Google Glass kind of disappeared, but there are other people that have invested in that area of technology and other companies have taken over the Google Glass and done something else with it. So, um, you know, this will definitely still be a part of the direction we're moving in. So take a, take a look and play with that a little bit. You know, the office lens is kind of fun to see what it can read easily. You know, everything's a work in progress. Don't expect all these things to work 100% super smoothly every time, right? Software things are prone to glitches, give the programmers and the companies feedback of what's working, what's not working, what you liked, what happened when they updated it, you know, all of that helps them to create better products. And so anyways, um, 
I'm really a, a fan of how thoroughly Microsoft has made their immersive reader available across their, their platform of um, supports. So kudos to them. Uh, you know, Apple has done something similarly. I think in this past year, they've really ramped up their, their offerings. Uh, you know, Google the same. So I think, I think this is, this has just been amazing in the last five years, what we've seen in accessible, um, universally available technology. So check out their built-in tools um, and give them feedback, what you like and don't like. All right, moving into the, it's still the writing, but the organizing and planning pieces. So imagine that the learner has challenges getting their ideas out and sorting them. And so giving them some scaffolding, like making boxes for them for like, uh, maybe it's part of a timeline and they, they need that chunked up. Maybe they need, you know, their first idea, their next idea, their third idea, and then their concluding um, sentence or paragraph at the end. So some sort of mind mapping software might help them. Uh, in my experience, this, this requires a lot of training, a lot of strategies to coach the user how to use it. But research has shown that the, a person with dyslexic thinking tends to think in pictures and in groupings, and they're often um, creative, and their minds are wired uh, uniquely, uh, differently, and they're able to, you know, sometimes we call them gifts um, that that don't always fit into the square box of an education system. But these mind mapping tools tend to be really useful for creative thinkers who don't necessarily like to line things up in a sequential way. They think in kind of these these groupings, which um, coincidentally or not, is kind of how our brains are arranged, right? Our brain will sort things into these three-dimensional groupings. So I like to kind of go back to that, that, you know, this mind mapping is really similar to how our brain actually is organized. So here are some different options for, for mind maps. There's so many out there. A lot of these have been around for a while. Inspiration and conspiration have been in the education programs for a long, long time. Uh, the ones towards the bottom, Mindoma, Lucid Charts, MindMup, um, and there's there's so many others. There, there's just more and more. Um, I also like MindMeister, it's not in there. Um, but those are kind of my favorites because they're easy to use, they have good, good tools, um, and then they all have free trials. Actually, I don't know about inspiration anymore. Um, Kidspiration is more for the younger ages. So for, for this group, probably if you're going to try it, inspiration or one of the three at the bottom is where I would start. All right. And then these things, these tools for organizing and planning are all around us now. We have calendars um, on our phones, on our watches, on our computer. We can sync them up. And so it's not a matter of find of accessing one because they're they're all right there for us. But how do you select one? Help somebody select which one works with their ability to visually process, which ones can be enlarged so that they can read it quickly and easily. So going through some different templates with them to figure out which calendar arrangement works for you, which interface works for you, right? And trying some of them. And then pairing that with habits and strategies, help them to understand how to think through what their day looks like and when, when might they be needing to calendar? Is it at the beginning of class, at the end of class, between classes, at recess, at lunch, at, you know, um, if you're in college, there isn't recess and lunch, so it'd be on your lunch break or when you go to the library, when you go out to the cart yard between your, you, know, you might have a 20, 30 minute Break in class. When are you going to do your calendar referencing? What is the habit going to be that sets you up for success for organizing and planning? 
Are you setting reminders with it? Are you adding relevant details into the calendar notes or description? You know, how much is appropriate and how does the user decide? Do they need coaching of how to make a good title for the event? You know, so learn who your user is and what their needs are and think of the areas that they might need support in. And even if it's just a prompt like, hey, did you see where you could put a URL into your calendar? So you don't have to go find your email or text or, or look through Canvas again and to try to find, um, you know, where's that link to log in or where's that link for, you know, uh, networking with your group, whatever it was, right? So put it right into the calendar right when you're making that event. So these are all strategies to think about. And the personal assistance. Um, I, I use personal assistance every day and I tell my phone, you know, add a countdown timer for 10 minutes, you know, add a event to October 31st that says wear a costume, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, you just tell your assistant to help you to do these things or set a reminder on, you know, Halloween to, you know, Bring your, bring your costume to work, right? <laughs> bring your costume to school, whatever it was, right? So, um, you know, your assistant is there, you know, for better, for worse, they're listening to what we're saying and let's, let's help them help us. <laughs> All right, we have also these types of tools. So for the college bound student who is getting complex assignments, right? Whether it's a, a report, um, or like a research paper, maybe they have to give a presentation, it's a speech. Maybe in science, they have to work with their team and, and develop a lab report. Do they know all the different steps to getting to that point where it's a finished product? If not, some of these organizing and planning websites can be really, really useful. So um, because we're local here in San Jose, I'm going to pop here into the chat, the San Jose State Assignment Calculator. And then you can type in there um, your assignment and it'll break down your assignment for you. And you put your due date in. So it has like a start date, an end date, and then, and then all the different um, uh, steps you need to accomplish with the target date assigned to you. To you. So uh, University of Minnesota was one of the first to come out with them. And uh, I really like their tool. The details that they have describing the different steps are fantastic. So it's uh, available for any student to use. Just because you're not at University of Minnesota doesn't mean you can't use it. You can still use it to break down your assignment. So um, go to the website, plop in your start date, due date, and select which type of assignment it is and have it calculate all the different um, little steps involved with doing your research paper or creating a speech or a lab report. It's all right there to support the user. And then you can take that and then put it into the calendar, right? So adding one habit, connecting one habit into the next can be really uh, useful. All right, and then moving into these higher levels of learning, high school, we see a ramp up in the note-taking requirements, college, an even bigger jump, an even bigger requirement. And sometimes the note-taking is not even in-class note-taking. It's like, read these five chapters all on your own and take your notes. So um, let's talk about some strategies for note-taking. So in class, you if you have worked with a um, student disability office, there's one, at every college campus, they might go by different names though. It might be um, student success office or student disabilities office, or um, you know they have some whatever take on the name like that. So go there and you can contact them. Even if you're not a student there, but you intend to apply or you really want to be a student there, you can go and contact that office and find out um, what their intake process is like. Is there an online application? Is there an in-person piece? And uh, once you get the, the intake done and if they've set up an accommodations plan for you at the college, then you could talk about different accommodations. If one of your accommodations includes being a peer, having uh, 
note support. And it might be a peer note taker. It might be uh, that you get to audio record. Uh, it might be that you can uh, audio record, but choose something like maybe might offer you one thing, but you use something else. So note taking, uh, so a peer note taker is somebody that the, that the student disability office, they hire somebody in your class to take notes and then they'll turn them in to the disability office and you get a copy. Sometimes they have a hard time finding a peer note taker. So if that's the case, you might ask them about note taking express. This is somebody who um, you would send an audio recording of your class notes to, and then they would send back, they would transcribe and send back, not a complete set of notes, but their summary of the, the audio recording that you sent them. So that's note taking express. Um, I think there are some other options too with their services. So you can check them out on their website. So if you really like to handwrite, um, but also want to record, then um, a smart pen might be an option for you. And this is the LiveScribe pen. And so it's showing you that with a special pen, you can record and you use their specialized paper and the paper has built into it a stop, you know, a record, stop and pause button here. And so your pen has an infrared tip and it knows exactly what page in this notebook you're writing on. And so it's, re it's syncing the recording to wherever this pen tip is writing on these specially designed pages. And so you could go back after class and if you take this on and put it in play mode and touch the pen tip to that part that you wrote on your paper, you'll play back the recording exactly at that spot. Okay. And there are some other types of pens that they have that um, can sync with an iPad. And so what you write in the notebook gets synced up into the iPad uh, app. And then you could toggle it to be the a typed version versus your handwriting version. So that's one option of, of uh, a high-tech um, note-taking support. Now, more and more, we're seeing colleges use uh, Glean. Glean used to have a different product called the Audio Note Taker, but uh, you know they phased out of that and they created a newer product that's more like, uh, to me, it operates kind of like social media. So if you look down here, oh, oh, first over here on the left, this student on their computer has downloaded the slides and imported them into their app Glean. In the middle is, is, are the notes that this person is typing. So they're typing into the, the text box. And every time they push the carriage return, it's, um, it's adding it here. And then here on the right is a representation of the sound recording. And so when there's a gap in sound, it kind of narrows. And when they're speaking, it's kind of a bar. And as you're listening, maybe you're typing a little and there's like, oh, as I was typing, I missed something. So maybe you want to use the exclamation point to tag the recording and it'll, it will show kind of like down here um, where you've made your little, uh, your little uh, responses. So you can jump right back. And so you would need to assign meaning to the symbols that you're tagging your recording with. So some likely types of meanings you might assign is, um, you know, I missed it. Uh, nothing, another one might be the professor said, this is really important. It will be on your test, right? So you need to tag that spot. Or maybe it's like memorize memorize this and be able to analyze it, you know, or compare this to, um, you know, and it refers to something you have to independently read. So maybe have something like, you know, read and supplement um, some other icon, right, to do on your own. Anyway, so this is an example of, of another note-taking assistive technology option. It would also require some thoughts on what types of habits and training a person would need to properly use this 
smoothly, right? It's a lot to do. You got to upload, you got to take notes, you got to tag. Uh, there's a lot going on besides just sitting in a dynamic classroom environment, or maybe you're learning online. So it, it would work in, in both scenarios. Obviously, if you're recording in person, the closer and you're using your, your mic from your computer, the closer you sit to the speaker, the better your sound quality. So that's the, the pro tip of audio record recording or any of them, including these. So these are three more options for audio recording notes. Uh, two of them are, are uh, iPad only. And then um, OneNote, I think, is works on a lot of different platforms, computer or tablet. Okay, so here are some other ones that you can try that have audio recording options. Okay, so for um, note taking, here are some different strategies and routines to consider. I'm going to just move on because I want to get through more technology. Uh, for note taking, if you're writing on an iPad, this paper like screen protector is really, really useful because it gives your iPad texture. You might find that when you use the Apple Pencil, it feels really slippery while you're writing on the glass. And so, um, you know, a, a plastic tip on glass can feel very slippery and you can't control the tip very well. So the paper like screen protector gives it texture, some roughness so that when you write, it feels like you're writing on paper. Um, try some digital pencils, some various grips. So you can see on my digital pencil, I've got this silicone sleeve on it to help me feel more comfortable. It makes it a little thicker, allows me to have better grip. And so that's what I use on mine. All right. All right. I really want to get through math. So um, there's so much good stuff out there. So I apologize if if there is too much that I've crammed in here, but you will get all the slides. You will get my, my resource list it is full of links. You can, um, you're gonna get everything. Anyway, so AT for math, let's go through the big, the heavy hitter. This guy, Equatio, is designed for individuals with dyslexia, dysgraphia, who are able to, um, to want to do math and have difficulty either with the reading, with the writing, and so this type of support. So you can see with the GIF um, how it is writing. You can use uh, speech dictation and it types it out. You can also use, it has different math option settings. So you can click on math. It also works with chemistry. You can also have it suggest formulas. So if you're typing and you're typing out the beginning of part of a formula, it can suggest the rest of the formula for you. Okay. And so you still have to do the math. You still have to do the computation, but it can help suggest what, um, make a suggestion. So if you knew it was an exponent, so you Type the E and it will suggest some, you know, some, some word suggestions there for you. Okay. And it also works in the Google Forms. So that's really nice. So I know a lot of teachers are starting to put tests and quizzes into Google Forms. And so that does work in Google Forms. There are all kinds of calculators out there. There's a Desmos calculator, it has text-to-speech, and so here I'm showing you the different math keyboards that are available. It can do graphing. Uh, you could have it read aloud. Um, so this one is designed for somebody with visual impairment. It can work with your screen reader. GeoBra is a similar product to Desmos. And then this is ModMath. ModMath is developed by a father who has son who has a son with dyslexia, dysgraphia, and um, he has been evolving this according to his son's 
needs and age. So now it's able to do advanced math and it's also available not just on the iPad, but also on the Android tablet and a Chromebook. So it works um, across those platforms. So it has the math keyboard. And then as you do the math, it inserts it into a grid line paper. And then this could then be exported and sent to whoever the student needs to send it to. Math Picks is a way that you could take a picture of something in a textbook. It extracts it into uh, a Google Doc or into, um, to, into a separate document, and then you could solve, do the math computations there. It can have, it has read aloud functionality. And the Math Solver also is, uh, you know, also has the math keyboard, has advanced math calculators. It can help you solve it. So this one does do all the solving for you, but you have to still show your work. So um, you, it's a good way to check your work if you need to do that. And then, of course, there's just so many things out there. They're always evolving. There's always something else. Um, but be careful who you're downloading, especially extensions. You know, there are things out there that can mine your data. So all the things that I've shared with you have all been kind of the, the big players and have been around a long time, have proven themselves as, as, um, as honest, um, you know, serving the right purpose, let's say. So, but there are other things out there. Uh, just take a look at the different options. For sensory, there are a lot of different sensory things out there. A lot of them can be used for calming. And, you know, when your sensory needs are not balanced, then sometimes somebody can feel agitated, nervous, anxious, right? And so when we feel out of balance, from a sensory perspective, we can go find some input from an occupational therapist, from the doctor who, who has knowledge about these types of, of things. And when they make recommendations, um, there are all kinds of different AT options for addressing sensory needs. All right, I'm going to keep going and mention that there are AT for social skills. Uh, there's all different apps. There are online groups where you could talk about things, you know, share strategies, ask for strategies from, um, from the group. So like crowdsource some ideas. There are conversation cards available. So if you have social anxiety, maybe pre-select some conversation ideas and keep them with you in case um, you need that type of support. All right, moving into mental health. Uh, you know, I just wanted to preface this with saying I am not a counselor. I don't have you know training as a psychologist, but just talking about the different supports that are out there. There are um, supports in the high school, in the college, the student health clinics. There are crisis lines. NAMI is a national organization for mental health. Uh, there's a crisis text line that started a couple of years back. Uh, the student disability office where you got student services started for the college supports. Um, great place to go say like, hey, I'm struggling. I don't know what to, I don't know how to describe it, but I'm struggling and they will be able to, um, you know, guide the conversation moving forward. If you have college advisors, any of those people could be people you just broach the subject with and um, they can help guide you to to community supports around you. All right. And just, um, you know, there are a lot of self help options out there from self-care, anxiety management, meditation apps, health tracking, fitness apps, and more. There are just so many good things out there right now. So um, just try a couple things and see what, what interface you like and see if it works. 
Okay. Earlier, we mentioned that in you, when you go to the student disability office, you have to disclose your disability and then show documentation of your disability. Well, one thing you could use to help you document your disclosure and feel comfortable with understanding who you are and with your disability, how it's affecting you is to go through some person-centered planning exercises and develop a one-page profile. So here's some resources for that. And then on this path to self-determination, right? A, a student who is bound for and seeking higher levels of learning wants to be self-determined. They want to make their own choices. They want to be good self-advocates. They want to be able to take care of their own problems and set their own goals and, and to be in tune with what's working for them, what's not working for them. Um, and so, you know, make sure that you're on this path and you're practicing, you know, good habits that support these aspects of being self-determined. And you do have to disclose so that you can tap into these supports and hopefully with the right supports uh, that you'll be able to reach the, su the success that you're striving for. Okay. And so um, key takeaways. So that was a lot of information. <laughs> There are many AT options for college-bound individuals. There's reading, writing, spelling, note-taking, organization, planning, math, sensory, social skills, and more. So consider what strategies and support could be paired with the AT. I've said that so many times, right? I really want you to take that away with you today that you know the strategies are as important or more important than the AT itself. Right, because can you give somebody like a crutch, if somebody breaks their leg, can you give them a crutch without fitting it to their height, without teaching them how to like um, use it and how to uh, balance, you know, move the crutches forward and then swing the body through, right? It takes some coaching, some support and then weaning off the support at some point and then helping them develop confidence, teach them how to go down the stairs, upstairs, right? How to do that safely. Um, even something as, as low tech as using crutches also requires training and support. And so theoretically, the more high tech something is, the more support and more complexity it has. And so the more support somebody might need for that. So um, on that note, I'm going to answer q and I know we're gonna go over time at 7.30 now. So if you had to leave, I totally understand. It was my pleasure to have you here in my webinar tonight. I hope it was enjoyable for you and you learned a lot. I'm going to launch a poll and then I'm going to answer questions. So if you wouldn't mind answering these questions, it really helps us to retain our funding, we get audited and they ask us, you know, you know, they want to see the data of how people felt about the, the trainings that they participate in. Was it of high quality, blah, 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 right? You go ahead and you take care of that. I'm not going to look at it. And uh, I'm just going to leave that up for a little while. And I'm going to go into the Q&A. All right. Um, okay. Give an example of how AT can assist a student with self-advocacy. So I think earlier we had some of the tools of, you know, talking about your disability helps you to gain security, gain confidence, put words to something, right? Doesn't mean you are your disability because you're so much more, and you know, a person is so much more than their disability, but being able to describe your needs as a learner, your needs as a human being, your needs as an employee or an internship or whatever the case may be, you know, being able to describe what you need from others so that you can have the best chance of success is really important. So getting in tune with oneself and being able to self-advocate is really important. So just, um, you know, take a look at these one-page profiles and some of the tools involved with person-centered planning because there's so much in there that helps one reflect about what's important to them, what's important for them, and how do you find the balance in between? which is ultimately, a, you know, uh, a, about getting the support that you need. <laughs>